Thank you very much. Um, so good afternoon, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, good morning or, or good evening, depending where you are joining. It's a pleasure um, to be uh, with you today to speak about uh, how to rethink structural transformation in the Africa LDCs in the era of technological advancement and innovation. This is uh, session three of the um, Africa Review Conference. My name is Maria Jose Torres. I am the UN Resident Coordinator in Malawi. And I have a fantastic team around the table, the virtual table to, to really discuss and debate this issue. Let me introduce um, the Right and Honorable Dr. Saulus Klaus Chilima, the Vice President of the Republic of Malawi and the Minister of Economic Planning and Development and Public Sector Reforms, who is with us today. Mr. Mario Pezzini, the Director of ACDE Development Center. Ms. Doreen Bogdan Martin, Director of the ITU. Mr. Ken Sawa, Senior Economist, Regional Office for Africa of the ILO. Ms. Nadia Santa Lucia, General Manager, Digital Inclusion, Microsoft Philanthropies. Mr. Butena Germasi, Director of Digital Development Department in the Infrastructure uh, Practice Group of the World Bank. And we also have a lead discussant that is also going to share with us from UNIDO, Mr. Farouk Alidman Jov, um, um, a presentation. So um, let me just go very quickly on some housekeeping rules uh, for all of us. Uh, so we maximize the time that is always against um, any uh, debate, whether it's virtual or physical. And uh, please, for speakers, let's make sure that we have the video on and uh, we have only the mic on when we are speaking. Uh, when we are not, uh, we just mute. And um, we, I'm going to be... Um, trying to help speakers to keep on time. So I will um, alert you when you only have one minute to go. So uh, very much um, uh, among ourselves, trying to do the keep uh, uh, the, the timekeeping. And then actually uh, uh, I'll be also checking the chat uh, to see if there are questions from the floor. Um, I was this morning in a very interesting uh, side event on youth and um, innovation and acceleration of the SDG agenda. And we had fantastic interventions from the floor. So I'm, I'm hoping today we are going this afternoon to have the same. So before I, I open, I'd like just to, to make a couple of, just to bring um, everybody uh, on the same page, just to think, uh, to see exactly what we are debating today. Well, first of all, um, the, the whole point that we are discussing is how we leapfrog the SDG agenda in the next uh, 10 years. And obviously, uh, there is an acknowledgement, and we are going to prominently going to discuss that today, that we need to have um, new dynamic um, activities. There has to be other things happening, particularly in Africa and Haiti, that allow uh, to have a higher productivity, and also increasing returns, but also at a scale. So it's not enough to have a few interesting um, experiences, but we really need to bring it up to a scale. We know the challenges, we know LDCs um, have issues in terms of integrating the global, be integrated into the global value chain. We know that there are issues with their logistics and the infrastructure. And we know that there are also um, a heavy dependence on the raw components. So, the question then comes that in a year uh, of COVID or post-COVID, I hope uh, we can say that soon, we need to really think on how we actually uh, bring transformation. Maybe we don't need to do business as usual, but business uh, unusual. And I like to really mention something that the Secretary General uh, of the UN uh, provided for. And, and he said, 2020 brought us tragedy and peril. 2021, we need to put the world back in track. And when he said the world, he said all countries, so LDCs, middle income, all countries, from death to health, from disaster to reconstruction, from despair to hope, from business to usual to, usual to transformation. And I have to say that by listening to the conversations in this, in this conference, we can say that momentum for transformation and change is growing. This morning we had um, Malawian youth so forthcoming and so clear on what they want to do, not just for their country, but for the continent and for the world. 
that I think um, it is in the panel some uh, to take and answer some of the questions on how the public sector and at the policy level, how the private sector, and how we absolutely include all people, you know, not just the usual suspect, but also women and, uh, and persons with disabilities and young people to be part of this transformational agenda. Thank you very much. I'd like to open the, the, the floor and invite um, uh, Honorable, um, Right Honorable Chilima, Vice President of the Republic of Malawi. Thank you very much, Vice President. The floor is yours. And all panelists, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Positive, we can. Right. So uh, I'll just say what program was observed. Um, I'll, I'll give a couple of uh, perspectives. One is the status of uh, structural transformation uh, in the LDCs. So first being the fact that uh, the 23rd SDGs recognize the critical role uh, that innovation plays in achieving the transformative agenda. Uh, second is to say that, uh, as such, Malawi and other African LDCs and Haiti should forget any meaningful development if we ignore structural transformation in this era of technological advancement and innovation. Uh, we will also discover, unfortunately, that our economies have one defining characteristic, uh, that is uh, the sole dependence on limited export basis dominated by primary products in agriculture and, and mining or in the mineral sector, which normally fetch very low prices on the international markets. Now, what is Malawi's uh, structural transformation agenda? In pursuit of the structural transformation agenda, Malawi has launched a new vision uh, for Malawi 2063, launched uh, last month. And the Malawi 2063 builds on the vision 2020, which expired in December last year. And it actually has strategies that will position the country on a structural transformation path. The traditional basis for structural transformation has been the manufacturing sector, which is expected to be a major contributor to Malawi's economic growth and development, and will be reinvigorated with, to ensure uh, strong and forward-looking linkages with sectors like agriculture and mining by promoting value addition. That notwithstanding, the Malawi 2063 vision focuses on other sources of sustainable development, including technological advancement and greening the, the country's growth to address the challenges exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change, respectively. Now, just to talk a bit on the COVID-19 pandemic, Malawi is aware that the COVID-19 pandemic has exerted extra pressure on our economies. Surely, there is need for resilient policies if we are to build back better after the scourge of coronavirus. The pandemic has proven that technology and innovation in all sectors will be critical if the African LDCs and Haiti are to generate the required decent employment for our population, particularly among women, youth, and other marginalized groups. And uh, what is the role of the state in development? Malawi's long-term development strategy is underpinned by an inclusive democratic developmental state philosophy which will prioritize long-term growth and structural change. With the state playing an active role, while having strong alliances with the private sector in addressing market failures. This includes having development trailblazer parastatals that run on business principles in strategic greenfield investments. And then the Malawi digital vision we envision a country with world-class digital economy that is globally competitive with, among other things, very sound e-commerce, e-learning, e-health, and e-governance systems. Investment in technology and innovation infrastructure shall be promoted to increase digital access 
and technological absorption. Technology shall be embraced in a way that promotes inclusive development and financial systems. Financial services and products will be offered through diverse and modern digital platforms that are convenient, available, and accessible to everyone, especially those in the remote areas. Now, talking about structural transformation, clean growth and recovery, I would like to encourage all of us to seriously think about structural transformation as we pursue the 2030 agenda for the SDGs. Building back better after COVID-19 is of paramount importance. As a matter of fact, it is not a multiple choice. Malawi is more determined in pursuing clean growth and sustainable development while incorporating technology and innovation policies so that we increase our productive capacity and achieve structural transformation. In this regard, as the country marches towards achieving SDGs by 2030, structural transformation will be a catchphrase for our developmental strategies, both in the short and medium term. I would like to end there and uh, sincerely thank you for your attention. Over to you. Uh, Thank you very much, Vice President, for being such a fantastic speaker in, 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 the, in exactly the time allocated, uh, an example. And I think you bring us all to think about how to access um, the digital transformation that Africa requires, including Malawi, the strong role of the public institutions and alliances and also the, um, particularly the role of private sector in terms of financial inclusion. Thank you very much for these very uh, important opening remarks. And, uh, and we are very, very honored to have you in the call. I know that you have to leave because you have very high responsibilities. So, but we want to thank you very much for being with us today. So um, we have uh, then, um, if I may, uh, we would like to pass the floor to Mr. Mario Pe Pezzini. He is the director of OECD Development Center, and he's going to be talking about um, the report uh, precisely touching upon uh, digital transformation and quality jobs, and how really uh, LDCs can tap into this new way of finding um, uh, quality jobs. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Mario Pezzini. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be together. We were in Istanbul, actually, and we were in Istanbul when it was organized for the LDCs, and we promoted a partnership that has been renewed now because in October we organized an high level symposium on vulnerability and financing the LDCs. So it's a pleasure to be here with you and continue that discussion as we are continuing uh, to help uh, on the way to Doha. Well, uh, my first point is that the shock caused by the COVID-19 should not be underestimated. And that's why I cannot agree more with the vice president just spoke. With COVID-19, all the LDCs worldwide uh, will have a drop in their GDP in, in 2020. For Africa LDCs, this drop is around minus four two of GDP per capita, an unprecedented threat to financing for Africa development, also because saving can drop of 18%, remittances of 9%, FDI of, uh, are staggering at 40%, and therefore growth and structural transformation observed before the crisis uh, is confronted with the fact that, again, did not deliver enough quality job for Africa people, and the efforts needs to uh, continue on the way of productive transformation. Let me say at this point, my second point, yes, digitalization can be a powerful lever. Digitalization was already well underway in Africa, including in many LDCs. Africa now has over 480 million mobile money accounts, is the highest in the world. And the pandemic has created a strong political momentum for accelerating digital transformation, I'm referring to education, ministries of education in 27 African countries to provide well-functioning e-learning platforms for students by May 2020. And uh, most African central banks strongly encourage the population to use digital payments in Rwanda. This has increased fourfold. 
So everything is there, but, but, but. Well, productive transformation is not just digital. If we concentrate only on the digital sector, well, what can provide uh, uh, in terms of employment the sector? Well, in nine countries where we have calculated, it will provide 270,000 jobs, whilst in those countries in which we have made the calculation, the new people entering in the labor market in next year will be 9 million. I repeat, 270,000 versus 9 million. So first, digital means a, a passport to development if it becomes a technology integrated in other sectors. Here will be the major gain if we want to go there. But therefore, what to do? Well, we don't need to go back to the past. The past was not bright. We had a level of growth that were very, very depressed. We didn't came out from the crisis of 2008. And we didn't have trade, 0.7% of increase in 2019. So the past before the COVID is not the model to push. We need stronger transformation. And to do that, we need a series of strong policy. We have heard an entrepreneurial state. We need industrial policy. They have been banned for 30 years from our language. And, and I am putting myself in the responsible, not as personally, but as international organization. We couldn't use that word. Now we need to relaunch strategy for industrialization. Obviously, we're digital in it, but not only digital. So these are crucial elements. And in particular, let me stress two points. I am old enough to have passed through the change in mechanic, for example, to co numerically control machines. And I was living in original small and medium-sized firms. And what have been done in order to guarantee that those firms were capable to pass through to the new world? Two things fundamental alphabetization. If only one engineer in a firm knows how to deal with digital, you will not go that far. If everybody understands, user and consumer, then you can integrate the new technology. And secondly, real services to small firms, knocking at the door of the firms and persuading the entrepreneurs to use the new technology. African entrepreneurs are extraordinary. They work much more than international official around the table here every day to survive. But what is lacking sometimes is the knowledge about the new technology. They are competitive. They are not uh, lazy or whatever. They are extremely competitive, but they need this local environment that helps them to continue to be competitive and grow. Thank you. Thank you, fantastic presentation, very uh, stimulating on the some of the opportunities, but also some of the risks and the enablers to really make sure that the digital transformation comes really with an impact. Thank you very much, Mr. Mario Pezzini. And thank you for being so respectful of the time. Um, uh, we have um, the next um, um, presenter is uh, Ms. Doreen uh, Bogda Martin, Director ITU. And um, okay, we, we are discussing uh, how tradable high productivity services can really um, be drivers of growth for the LDCs. And if indeed ICT tourism and agro industry can see taking off and really uh, expanding at a scale. So how we can, again, tapping in the questions raised by Mario, um, digitalization be make accessible and knowledge be accompanied uh, this exercise. Thank you. Um, over to you, Doreen. Thank you, Maria Jose. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Uh, emerging technologies are rapidly transforming development actions across all sectors and industries. Digital technologies, as we know, hold great promise for breaking down old barriers as you said, Maria Jose, to, to make that leapfrog. Uh, but digital access or its lack also brings with it the risk of widening social and economic gaps between those are, who are connected and those who are not connected. And to get a picture of where we are now, I wanna share very quickly a couple, of, a couple of figures. ITU data shows that while Overall mobile coverage for the African continent now stands at about 88% of the, of the population. 
in LDCs, 17% of the rural population still have no mobile coverage at all, with a further 19% only covered by a 2G signal. LDCs are also falling progressively behind in terms of both broadband uptake and internet use with just 33 mobile broadband subscriptions for every 100 inhabitants compared to 65 in developing countries. And only 19% of individuals in LDCs are using the internet compared to 44% in the developing world overall. And while uptake is higher among young people, a mere 38% of youth in LDCs are internet users. And of course, women in LDCs fare even worse with only just over half the number of women online as men at 15 and 28% respectively. That's the, the stat snapshot. But now I'd like to look at what lies at the heart of this growing digital poverty. Affordability is clearly one issue. Africa has the most expensive broadband in the world at an average cost of 11% of monthly GNI per capita. Being connected on the African continent is almost three times as expensive as the world's next most costly region and more than five times the target of 2%, which was set by the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development. Policy and regulation can play a major role here, and we need to look at strategies to drive down price reductions and discounts on capacity, airtime, and devices. We also need to look at alternative funding models for complementary access solutions, from infrastructure sharing to accelerating deployment of universal service funds and really creating those right conditions for private sector investments. But affordability is not the only issue here. Lack of digital skills is now widely recognized as a formidable barrier to digital, digital uptake. And this brings me to an example I wanted to share with you, and that is ITU's partnership with UNICEF called GIGA. Uh, it's about connecting every school on the planet to the internet and every young person to information opportunity and choice. And the Giga, the Giga team is working with governments to create investment opportunities for blended public and private sector funding, to build the infrastructure needed to provide universal access to every school, and perhaps most importantly, to equip learners with high quality vetted and safe content. The Giga project will help children in LDCs to become true digital natives. But because schools can also serve as anchor points for the entire community, we've expanded the Giga vision so that connected schools can also serve as digital skills training hubs. And we're working in Rwanda, in Niger, in Sierra Leone, and we're also in good discussions with Benin, with Togo and Ethiopia. We're also working with Zambia and Rwanda to promote digital skills development through our digital transformation centers and working in Burundi and Ethiopia on a project focused on using technology to drive women's economic opportunities in the textile and apparel industry and the coffee and cocoa value chains. And our Smart Village initiative with the government of Niger, I think is a great example of innovation and partnership, bringing broadband and digital services to rural communities through a holistic approach, emphasizing local leadership and I think these examples pick up on Mario's point that, that digital is the passport to development, but not on its own, only if it's integrated with the other sectors. So ladies and gentlemen, bringing that transformational power of digital to the world's least developed countries will be a priority focus, as His Excellency the Vice President said, in building back better. It will also be the focus of our upcoming World Telecommunications Development Conference that will take place in November hosted by the government of Ethiopia. And at that event, we will bring governments, the private sector, development banks, and the global development community together to create an implementable roadmap to bring digital development opportunities to all. I think the COVID crisis has given us this once in a lifetime opportunity to harness an unprecedented level of political will and private sector energy around connectivity. And I would like to just warmly urge all of you to be part of this process, join our preparations, the conference itself. It will then feed into the LDC5 conference in, 2020, in 2022. 
and let us all work together to forge a digitally enabled future for every African. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dorian. Fantastic uh, presentation. Also very enlightening on the issue of just being aware of the risk of not leaving farther behind um, parts of the planet because the investments are not there. It's not affordable. They don't have skills. So we really need to continue using digital as bringing back better and less capitalize on the political will and think uh, forward as is the invitation. Thank you, this has been great. Uh, we are going now to Mr. Ken Shawa. He is the senior economist in the regional office for Africa of the ILO. And, um, and actually we wanted to, to, to get uh, a bit inspired in terms of the future. I mean, Malawi has, as the vice president has mentioned, the vision 2063 uh, of a middle income country. And um, I think that's the aspiration of African countries in the next 10 years. How is the future looking for these countries and how these technologies uh, can really affect the industries and uh, actually insisting on the issue of uh, recovery after COVID, building back better. Over to you, uh, Mr. Ken Sawa. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to share the screen. I need, to share, I need to get to the, okay. Thank you very much. Um, just to be sure, um, will I be controlling that or somebody's controlling on my behalf? I will be controlling it. And if you give me a little sign, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, okay, so let's go to the next uh, slide or, you know. Uh, yeah, so thanks uh, very much. Um, I want to start uh, by looking at uh, the sources of growth uh, that uh, you know Africa has. Uh, so the first thing that I want to highlight here in this table uh, is that uh, the workforce in Africa will be a very important uh, source of growth. Um, you, 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 you see um, on the table that um, the labor force participation has increased from the 2000s to uh, you know 2018 to 2021 by uh, uh, you know to about 518 million. Uh, you see the labor force participation rates are still you know above 60 percent, um, and you also see that the sectorial uh, employment still shows that agriculture is an important employer in Africa, uh, and also services are coming uh, second uh, to you know uh, employ. Uh, and the industry is lagging behind us. So we see here that um, the, the workforce will be a very important uh, source uh, of employment, a, a very good source of growth, uh, but also the agricultural sector because it already uh, is the highest employer. But I think more importantly, uh, labor productivity, which uh, you can see uh, in the graph there, the labor productivity growth uh, is very, very low. So it tells us that uh, if Africa has to grow, then we have got to do something on labor productivity. And already this ties with what others have talked about already in terms of skills and, and things like those. Uh, next slide. Now, um, uh, so what will these emerging technologies uh, do to the industries? Um, what, will they what will become uh, of the jobs? So we see that uh, adopting to technology is important. And as we know that technological advances are really the hallmark of the future of work, but we also want to understand that uh, the technological advancement will destroy jobs, uh, but at the same time, after destroying the jobs, it will create jobs in other sectors with other skill sets needed, and it will also transform other jobs as well. So what does that mean? That means that uh, we have got to tap into these new technologies, knowing that other jobs will be obsolete, while other jobs will be created and that others will actually be transformed. But to do that well, we have to develop appropriate policies that support uh, this adoption of new technologies. We must put investments that actually support uh, you know, infrastructure. So we are looking here, for example, uh, solar panels uh, on top of a grass thatched house. We are saying, let us have the right house so we can have a solar panel on a well-structured house, for example. Let's go to the uh, next uh, slide. Now, uh, we are also asking, so why, so what's the role of uh, ICT or tourism or agro-industrialization 
in this whole process of development. What we are simply saying is that agro-industrialization will be important, is important, has been important, because it does reallocate labor and other resources from the labor intensive uh, and less productive activities to the more technologically intensive ones that are also more efficient. And therefore, industrialization, technological transformation will be important in supporting growth uh, in Africa. But at the same time, we know that agro-industrialization does support modernization of agriculture. And once agriculture is mechanized, is modernized, that also, of course, affects or impacts positively uh, on development. And, uh, you know, in Africa, this is something that we really need. We have been working on agriculture. What we have not done is to agro-industrialize that sector. We need to do that. Uh, but we also know that the backward and forward changes that are in agriculture are important because they give us the most important multiplier effects in affecting, you know, our job creation and value addition. Let's get to the uh, other uh, slide, please. Just uh, a friendly reminder, one minute. Thank you. But also there is a question of whether tradable high productivity services are important. Yes, they are. They are potential to drive growth, but again, there are preconditions uh, that matter. So let's go to the other uh, slide. Now, what is missing? I think this is very important. Uh, what is missing in this whole agenda of industrialization, in this whole agenda, we do not yet have relevant skills. We must invest in skills, skills that will be able to adapt to the technological advancement that we are promoting. We must invest in education. Others have said that already. We must start invest in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and encourage our young people to look for jobs in the IC sector. We must, uh, in the spirit of the ILO Center Declaration, and the Abidjan Declaration of the ILO, lifelong learning systems are important. We must institute them because we have got to be able to have the schemes that will matter, that will be able to allow us to move. And then, of course, there are issues of coordination amongst ministries. There are issues of soft skills. Let's go to the other uh, you know, slide. Yeah, uh, this is my last slide. What we're saying is, so what are the best practices to promote entrepreneurship? innovation, value addition in the, technology, in the digital uh, you know, sector. Yes, we must make sure that we support intellectual uh, property rights. We must make sure that we have legislation that uh, you know, helps to improve the ICT innovation. We must ensure that uh, our industries digitalize. We must ensure that uh, entrepreneurship is policy within policy. It is mainstream in economic and employment policy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ken. Very difficult to summarize so much uh, information and, and tips, actually. I think it is uh, very important, the point that you're making about uh, technology uh, having the potential to certainly create jobs or transform jobs, but we have to also be aware that uh, we need to look into skills, education, science, technology, and lifetime skills if we don't want to destroy jobs. So I think it is a double edge, and uh, you have made a very important case for continue mainstreaming and coordinating across government. Thank you, uh, excellent uh, and inspiring presentation. And we are moving into, um, I think, private sector. Um, we have now um, Ms. Naria Santa Lucia. She is the general manager for digital inclusion. Um, and, um, and actually, um, this is quite an interesting um, presentation since it's looking at how a private company as big as Microsoft is looking into LDCs and how they say, see from their perspective, how the digital inclusion in LDCs can continue being expanding opportunities rather than increasing the gap. So over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's uh, such an honor to be on this panel. I'm learning a lot already. And I think a lot of the same and similar themes will definitely come through. And if you could uh, switch to the next slide. Uh, many of the panelists have already noted that around the world, there has you know, just uh, emerged one of the most challenging periods in our lifetimes. And just a few months and, and now throughout this year, we've had multiple challenges, a pandemic, 
global economic crisis with millions of people unemployed, furloughed, and otherwise impacted. And unsurprisingly, it's people that are hardest hit by the economic crisis or those that were you know, already struggling, that people living in poverty, women, people from underrepresented ethnic and racial minorities, people with disabilities, as um, many of the panelists have noted, and especially people from our world's least developed countries. So. You know, we know some of these jobs will certainly come back, but as the panelists have also noted, many won't. And even for, you know, workers that do return to jobs, they're going to return to a really different economy, a more digital economy. You know, again, panelists have noted that uh, we had digital transformation changing already before COVID. Um, I think in the first two months of the of the pandemic, our CEO Satya Nadella noted that there was more transformation, digital transformation in two months than there had been in the previous two years. So COVID is just really igniting and accelerating this digital transformation. In fact, if you look at our, we did our own Microsoft internal analysis and we found that if all major industries digitally transform, so not just tech technology, but as the panels have been saying, agriculture, financial services, manufacturing, if we all digitally transform, we actually believe the labor market can potentially absorb 150 million new tech roles by 2025. So these are roles in data, cloud, AI, software development, cybersecurity. And even if we're not even talking about those tech roles, we believe in the future, every job is going to be a digital job requiring not only just literacy, but digital fluency. So, you know, for us, it's really important that digital skills is a critical piece of this inclusive economic recovery as we go into the post COVID era. So if you could advance the slide. That's why right at the start of the um, uh, of the pandemic, we, you know, our, our companies, LinkedIn, Microsoft, GitHub, we thought, how can we help? We know lots of people are losing their jobs. How can we make sure that, um, you know, uh, individuals have the skills that they need during this COVID economy? So we launched this initiative, a global initiative to help 25 million people worldwide gain more digital skills. We've engaged um, over learners from over 231 countries and we'll have a little update here in the spring about where we are and, and how much progress we've made. But um, very importantly, uh, you know, in, in the African uh, least development country, developed countries, we've actually had learners um, engage from every single one of those countries and on the African continent itself, we've actually engaged over 1 million learners already. So what, what this initiative is really quickly, it's, it's kind of like, I think a theory of change on how we could approach skilling. It's looking at data from our LinkedIn economic graph to see what are actually the in-demand roles that are growing in the future um, available now and also can be achievable without a degree. So 10 in-demand roles were, were surfaced. And then we also surfaced free learning paths associated with each of those roles so that anybody could go you know, they needed to be connected to the internet, to the IT use is really important component. Um, if they go to opportunity.linkedin.com can go and start learning um, on any of those 10 pathways. They can then access low cost certifications and or free certifications um, um, and certificates of completion from LinkedIn. And then finally, we also enabled, you know, really critical tools, those horizontal soft skills, um, jobs to job finding um, pathways, tips on how to interview. And then recently LinkedIn has launched a, a way for you to put in your skills and then find a job um, that is most matched with your skills. Um, if you go to the next slide, but we know that this is not, you know, just something, this initiative was really helpful and it's really fantastic, but we know that this is not something that one company can solve alone, a problem that we'll, we'll be able to achieve on our own. And I think this is where we really need to think about in the post COVID era, like radical new partnership. How can we always go together? How can we take private sector innovations and the ability to really move quickly and move at speed and try and test things, fail fast and fail forward. How do we take those solutions that really work and then really scale them via government? Because there's just no other way to scale that uh, and have that motion. And then how do we take that scale and then land it in communities with NGOs and nonprofits? And we really need to do three of these things together. Um, so that we can really make that difference and go far. And finally, I just want to close with a story of, of, a, of, of a, a beneficiary um, who uh, went through the content. This is Miss Mabogo. Um, she lived outside of Johannesburg, 
prior to the pandemic, she was in a door-to-door sales role. Um, and of course that job went away during the lockdown. And she was at home on her phone and found the um, Global Skills Initiative content on LinkedIn, um, did her own study course online. And with just a few classes, she has now started a new job as a customer service specialist. So, you know, I think this is like, it is for individuals like Ms. Mabogo that we need to really think outside the box in the future, do things in a different way and really build back better as the vice president said. So thank you very much. Maya, thanks. Um, this has been also a fantastic uh, way of looking at uh, how private sector can bring innovation that can be embraced also at the national level. But I think it is acknowledged that both governments and uh, NGOs need to be present. If not, we are not going to close the gap. And I think in terms of accessibility to all these possibilities, I think is critical as well. So. The promise of 150 million um, tech roles, uh, new jobs, I think is, is quite enticing. And I think we are all looking forward uh, from the panel to see how we can materialize it, uh, certainly in Malawi. Thanks very much. So um, we are now moving into um, Ms. Butena Germazi. She is the director of um, Digital Development Department of the Infrastructure Practice Group. Um, and um, and uh, Ms. Germasi is going to be looking into, well, okay, what is urgent now? We are all listening uh, that technological advancements advancement and ICT uh, services are critical. But I mean, what is missing? What are we missing? So uh, this is uh, yet having these uh, statistics that are so low and how they can really leapfrog the difference between other countries, so they can actually uh, not be farther behind, but build back better. So over to you, Ms. Germasi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, delighted to be here. Uh, I think a, st a starting point, uh, which builds uh, very nicely on uh, my fellow panelists around the link between digital and development uh, that I'd like to stress. Uh, I think it's very important to see digital today as creating a new paradigm for development. Uh, it is difficult to consider growth, uh, poverty reduction, job creation, and the whole discussion around building back better without digital, but definitely not only with digital. I very much like uh, digital digital being a, a passport uh, for development. Uh, digital connectivity and digital platforms, they create means to support structural transformation of employment uh, that uh, LDCs are, are seeking. Uh, digital tools can make agriculture activities more productive. They can support manufacturing and services industry to be more connected and productive. Uh, we see many countries in the continent thinking seriously about uh, digital and thinking about the power of leapfrogging uh, that digital can offer uh, for social and economic development. Uh, thinking about digital platforms can be used to ensure inclusiveness for all citizens or community, youth and women, uh, very nicely uh, highlighted already by uh, the, uh, the other speakers. Uh, these uh, efforts are uh, also nicely happening at the national level, at sub-regional level, and at continental level uh, in, in, in Africa. Uh, the linkages between development and digital uh, are being documented, I think. Uh, I, I just want to highlight three studies that look at this uh, topic in the context of, the, of Africa. Uh, and I think all three of them are important to keep in mind as we think about the, the question that you asked. Uh, first, there is a study uh, uh, in 2019 that looked at uh, data from 12 African countries and clearly showed that people living in areas with access to fast speed internet have uh, more chances than other people uh, to be employed. And these chances, uh, chances can reach up to 13.9%. Uh, a recent analysis conducted by the World Bank and GSMA also focused on a specific example of Nigeria uh, and showed that extreme poverty decreased by 7% after two years of being covered by broadband. Um, there is opportunity to do the same study for, for LDC's country and uh, see uh, the linkages there. And according to a, a latest study by uh, IFC and, and Google, uh, they looked at the internet economy for Africa. It can reach uh, 
180 billion dollars by 2025, uh, and this uh, could constitute up to 5.2 percent of the continent's uh, uh, GDP. So. Uh, in the bank, uh, of course, it's a, a top priority for us uh, working uh, in Africa. Uh, we launched in 2019 the Digital Economy for Africa initiative. Uh, it's a comprehensive approach that looks at digital transformation in a holistic manner, uh, actually building on all the elements that all the panelists have mentioned today, uh, the importance of digital infrastructure, the importance of broadband access, access that is available, that is safe and affordable, as Doreen mentioned, but also the importance of skills, the importance of entrepreneurship, uh, the importance of, of uh, payment system, all of this, uh, looking at it in an ecosystem approach that also looks at the importance of managing risks, whether they are risks of exclusion or uh, risks around data protection or, or cybersecurity. And uh, this initiative is fully tailored uh, to support uh, the African Union's strategy on digital transformation, uh, aiming to reach universal broadband access by 2030. Um, if we reach that, that target, uh, it would raise growth per capita by 1.5 percentage point per year, and will reduce the poverty headcount by 0.7 percent point uh, per year. So emphasizing again the link with development. Um, to be successful in this ambition, uh, we need to address the challenges, uh, and these are different from country to country, de depending on the context of each country. Uh, we're uh, doing digital economy uh, assessment. Uh, today, we've done uh, 16 for African uh, LDCs. Uh, these assessments show that there is a big agenda on access uh, to broadband that we need to focus on. There are issues around skills, there are issues uh, around the broader enabling environment, uh, whether trade policies, access to finance, uh, and also issues around complementary infrastructure like electricity and, and logistics. Um, Doreen shared with us today the numbers, and I think they're very uh, sobering uh, in terms of uh, the journey ahead to make sure that broadband access in LDC's country become a reality and the issues around uh, affordability. Uh, uh, I will not cover this. I think it's a very, very, very um, important element to, to look at uh, in details as we think uh, about getting uh, LDCs all uh, to more connectivity. Um, it is a priority, as I mentioned, for the bank. I just want to give a couple of examples of uh, recent projects uh, working with LDCs. Um, uh, in Niger, the Smart uh, Village for Rural Growth and Digital Inclusion Project aims to uh, bring broadband access to over 2,000 rural communities. Uh, here we focus on policy regulatory reform, but also we focus on innovative financing uh, through reverse subsidy auction to reach uh, the rural uh, communities. Uh, Comoros is another example where we worked with the government to ensure connectivity to submarine uh, cable. Uh, also thinking about demand stimulation uh, as very important that demand and supply are seen um, uh, at the same time. Uh, and also thinking about financing of government networks, data centers. Uh, Malawi is a very good example uh, for uh, um, connectivity that needs to be tailored to the needs of landlocked countries. So we worked with the government uh, to create the virtu virtual landing station. And the focus is to make sure that uh, broadband access uh, becomes um, affordable. Uh, uh, it's, it's a very nice example also that uh, other landlocked countries can, can look at. Uh, and because the regional review also uh, covers Haiti, uh, let me share with you a recent project that uh, uh, was approved a few months back, uh, looking at digital acceleration to increase access to broadband services in the country and establish the foundation of digital resilience to respond to health, climate and economic uh, uh, shocks. Uh, so uh, the main point is uh, how do we work together to increase the voice of LDCs in shaping a digital future, uh, private innovation and public policy uh, that are needed to go hand in hand uh, to, uh, and need to consider potential for the poor to benefit in the digital economy, uh, supporting bottom of the pyramid innovation. 
uh, and also mitigating any uh, possible uh, risks. Uh, in all these countries, the World Bank has taken an ecosystem approach, as I mentioned, uh, so that countries achieve um, uh, and accelerate digital transformation. Uh, there are you know, a, a wide range of possible uh, collaboration uh, with the countries that we can discuss. Uh, we look forward to further engaging with uh, LDCs and coordinating closely with partners with the UN, uh, with development partners with the private sector to multiply the collective efforts. Uh, it is, I think, it is collaboration with the different partners like, like the ones uh, around the virtual table today uh, that will be key for all of us to uh, move the needle uh, on, on the stubborn digital divide for LDCs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, absolutely um, essential um, presentation regarding how um, we can actually um, create that partnerships that are necessary within the public sector, the private sector, to make sure that really um, the accessibility doesn't continue to leave behind a group of population. And there is a very interesting data uh, sustaining this thesis and uh, fantastic examples. I think in Malawi, as you mentioned, we are working on the digitalization of the economy and actually the bank is a very important uh, partner. So thanks very much, uh, Ms. Butena. Maybe just asking colleagues who really want to have questions uh, for the panel to put it on the chat, raise your hands. Um, we are about uh, completing the, um, the presentations and, and uh, my colleagues are going to indicate, we already have a question. I know, so if there are others, please go ahead. And um, we are now um, passing to our lead discussion, um, Mr. Farouk Ali, Alim Janov, who is the Industrial Development Officer within the Innovation and Digitalization Division at UNIDO. And, um, and he's going to take us on some of the issues that we have been discussing in the panel, um, but focusing particularly on agro-industry and tourism and how ICT can really uh, speed up um, in the access of LDCs to, uh, digital, to, to their economic transformation. Please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think I, have, I managed to share the screen. Uh, excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good day to everyone. Uh, with UNIDO actually, um, as we speak, expanding a digitalization portfolio uh, across the globe with even uh, projects being developed across the board in Malawi and trying to promote such digital tools as machine learning, satellite and drone imagery, artificial intelligence and green, uh, uh, innovative green processing technologies promotion. I was indeed requested to complement uh, to the discussions of the role that services such as tourism and other industry can play in uh, achieving accelerated, inclusive, sustainable uh, growth and meet the SDGs by 2030. So um, I just wanted to uh, bring you through our uh, direct example in an LDC uh, country where we uh, basically tried to promote uh, the better language, linkages of manufacturing industries and the tourism sector, because I would fully agree with Mr. Bifini, who was saying that productive transformation, which uh, Africa needs and LDC and all uh, least developed countries need um, uh, um, urgently is not only about in uh, digitalization, it's also about promoting uh, uh, integration between demand and supply, integrating private sector, integrating uh, uh, SMEs, institutions, uh, local banking sector. I think this is what we managed to achieve within our project in Tanzania, which was finished uh, just last year. Um, just to, to put the two words on the background, when we started uh, the project there, we faced the situation that tourists from, uh, let's say, uh, other countries were a little bit complaining that all the products available in the hotels, in the restaurants, in the uh, uh, big uh, uh, international supermarkets are not supplied from Tanzania, though tourists are expected to see something uh, uh, process based on the grow and produce, uh, then uh, it was SECO, uh, uh, the um, Federal Department for uh, 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 State Secretariat for Economic Affairs of Switzerland, uh, approached us together within the, the, the cluster of trade and productive capacity, along with our institutions, to address this uh, uh, problem in uh, 
sustainable way. So I think within the next two, three minutes, I will show what we have done and what we achieved only in 12 months of our work. So uh, basically what our tools were applied, we tried to indeed uh, uh, promote the deeper linkages between the SMEs and the tourism sector. We uh, uh, wanted to, uh, uh, we, we tried to uh, establish substantial truth force, the mid long uh, term business relationship between the operators. We're trying to uh, promote most aggressively the marketing sales merchandising and other uh, uh, tools to access market and market information. And we were trying to promote through some uh, testing and tasting activities, what actually the local uh, uh, producers can uh, supply to the growing uh, tourism sector in uh, uh, Tanzania. So this is our pride. This is a, a range of different market uh, promotion uh, uh, tools that we used within this project. But um, yeah, the, the simple things which we're basically promoting were apparently uh, absent there. And uh, uh, these are the pictures of the tasting events of the B2Bs we promoted on the uh, 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 shelf promotion of the products. Uh, that we did at the supermarket level. These are the uh, pictures depicting what we did and what we have achieved, but uh, there is a huge room to even advance further the marketing of the local uh, uh, supplies with the industry and the tourism sector with the bigger uh, customer markets through applying digital tools uh, like web-based promotion, uh, special applications uh, like InfoRoot, supports to the uh, uh, customers of the tourists, uh, promoting some specialized fourth industrial uh, revolution solutions for industries to be better linked with the tourism sector, et cetera. Another big achievement was that we promoted uh, the uh, ISO 22000 uh, uh, food management uh, uh, program implementation. And these are the, the promised results that we achieved only in 12 months uh, of our project. We managed to link the local producers, which were never linked to the tourism sector, to international market. For some, tourism is also another way to uh, reach export market, is by uh, linking those producers with 41 hotels, with 35 leading supermarkets, uh, with, with increasing the range of their clients with 100 hotels and restaurants in the country. And we are, as we're speaking about the big uh, providers, we're speaking about international hotel chains, through which uh, the, the, the producers are having also access to the export. And just to, to finish with very uh, 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 fig and great figures on, on the scale of, of, of uh, how we managed to uh, scale up the activity. So for instance, Nature of Kilimanjaro would have increased sales seven times. So by 600% uh, thanks to the two year project. And this is what we're talking about, the economies of scale and also economies of the scope, how many products the, uh, the local industry could have managed to produce to propose to the tourism sector. Uh, we also promoted some women leadership. So one of our clients for, uh, was uh, receiving award by the Forbes as the best uh, East African businesswoman of uh, 2017. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope that I fit to my uh, time. Meeting. Farouk, absolutely on time. So that was a pleasure uh, to also see the success of Tanzanian um, people really moving forward. So clearly, I think we need those stories as Nadia shared also the story of a person that just transformed her life like that. And I think you made a very important connection also on how you really need to bring together a private sector and, and, and public um, uh, sector. And I think it's a point that we have been consistently listening to by your panelists. So really thanks for this illuminated uh, presentation. I know we have a hand up. I'm going to continue inviting participants um, to really go into some of the specific questions to, I think we have a top class uh, panel that has really uh, tackled the issues of technical um, access to new technologies, transformation. Uh, so really I invite you, I would like to open the mic for Edouard Mulba, who is uh, part of the attendees. So maybe if you can uh, be unmuted and ask your question. Edouard, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks very much uh, for such very 
a great presentations by all the different panelists. But I just wanted to know that uh, given that all the, not all the least developed countries are even at the same level, uh, some are going through wars, others are emerging from wars, and while others are progressively developing in terms of technology and innovations. What kind of strategy can be employed by governments and partners to bring LDCs at the same level in terms of those, uh, in terms of uh, technology and innovations? Thank you, Edward. Uh, could you please introduce yourself, sorry? Uh, I'm Edward Moba. I am the uh, executive director for the Liberia Peace Building Office at the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Fantastic. So, how to support countries that have just um, went um, through a war and plus COVID? I think that's a good question. Let's see if there are other questions. Uh, is there any other questions? Questions from the chat? Maybe my colleagues from um, the Office of, uh, of the High Representative can mention that question so panelists can respond. We don't have another question from the chat, but we have another raised hand by oh, Mamadou sorry. Dia, who can now speak. Thank you, Amadou. Please introduce yourself. Merci, uh, c'est Mamadou Dia du Ministère de l'Economie uh, et du Plan du Sénégal. Point focal national pour le suivi du plan d'action. Comme l'ont évoqué les, les panélistes, la part importante de, des progrès technologiques et d'innovation dans la transformation structurelle de l'économie. Mais euh, tout récemment, la pandémie de la COVID-19 a montré les limites surtout dans, dans les paiements. Et ce besoin, ça a monté aussi le gap et les inégalités d'accès euh, importants par rapport, par rapport à, à l'accès aux, aux technologies euh, et à l'innovation. Et comme en Afrique, on a un, un capital humain à, à renforcer et je pense que M. Ken, euh, Ken Shawa, tout à l'heure dans sa présentation, en a parlé, le développement des, des des STEM, le développement des STEM. Aujourd'hui, quel est le lien qu'on doit faire, surtout en termes d'investissement, si on veut résorber le gap en termes de renforcement du, du capital humain, parce que sans un capital humain, on ne peut pas aller vers une transformation structurelle de, de qualité euh, dans les paiements. Thank you. Thank you, Amadou. Um... Thank you very much. Um, there is um, another question that maybe we can open for the panelists to, to respond um, about rethinking a structural transformation and if we are rethinking what is exactly that is different. Um, so uh, from previous theories of producing digital. So I think we have three questions uh, from Liberia, Senegal, and, um, and also uh, Britina Diamet. I, I don't know what, where is, uh, maybe you can introduce yourself in the chat. Um, is there any um, particular order? Would you like to take this question? Mario, please, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that the question of Edward was very, very important. In other terms, if the LDCs are so different, how can we suggest for all the same type of solution? We can't. Actually, we thought that the process of modernization was organized along a similar trajectory, where the country that made it first with the machete can turn their head and tell to the other the path to follow. It's not that way. We are all different countries with different characteristics. So what we can do is to organize with country efforts to identify the specific trajectory, the, the specific strategies to develop and how we can learn from the difference of the other. So what we desperately need is a table where country can come, sit 
tell the story and receive from peers suggestion and indication. So that's apply in particular also to health disease because many are depending from natural resources, other have manufacturing, other rely on tourism, and all these three sectors at present are in crisis. My, uh, if you allow me, uh, Amadou, je pense qu'il a adressé une question fondamentale, qui est la question des ressources humaines et comme elles sont indispensables maintenant pour la récupération. Or, je pense que confronté à la digitalisation, on doit lancer des gros campagnes, des gros efforts d'alphabétisation, comme je disais. Mais il y a aussi un autre point qui est émergé ce matin et hier à, à, au Forum Afrique euh, qui est le président Macky Sall a lancé. Et le point est, on a désespérément besoin de formations techniques. Technique signifie aussi des structures comme les community colleges aux États-Unis ou les polytechniques en Angleterre ou les services aux entreprises euh, que l'UNIDO a so bien, euh, étudié de façon aussi précise et, et bien en Baden-Württemberg. Tous ces types de structures sont désespérément nécessaires parce qu'on doit aider les PMI à avoir des services réels qui les aident à améliorer leurs compétences, leurs techniques et leur force de travail. Merci. Thank you very much. Maybe there are a couple of questions for other panelists um, as, as we move um, that are quite interesting. So they're rethinking the structural transformation, what is different? And uh, maybe uh, Butena and uh, Doreen can take that uh, question, if I may. And there is also a question about uh, how different um, donors or funding institutions, um, maybe the the private sector institutions can also uh, actually be most effectively leveraged so they can be coordinated. And maybe Naria and uh, Ken and, and, uh, and um, uh, Mr. Andy Janov can comment on that, if I may suggest. Please go ahead, um, um, Ms. Butena and Rin for the first question. Thank you. Uh, very good questions. And I, I'd like to uh, comment on a few of them if, if possible. I think it's a, uh, a combination of uh, interesting questions. Uh, just on, on the first one uh, about the importance to get uh, a different path to different countries, depending on where they stand. I, I want to emphasize that this is very important. Within L LDCs, of course, you know, there is the sources of growth, but also there is the geographical situation of each country. And I think, you know, countries in landlocked situation need to think about digital transformation in a way that is different from, you know, small countries, from small island countries and from countries with a big geography that needs to have, uh, uh, you know, different approaches. So as we think about uh, how do we tailor the response of each country, it's, it's a very important point that, uh, you know, the question addressed. Uh, there is also the maturity. I mean, not all countries are at the same level when it comes to the different foundation. So uh, it's, it's going to be different from, from one country to, to the other. Uh, um, on the issue of the human capital, I mean, it is a foundation that is as fundamental and as important as, uh, as connectivity. Uh, today, we cannot talk about digital transformation without dealing with the human capital dimension as a foundation and here when we think about it it's really an there is an ecosystem within the ecosystem i think when we talk about digital skills it's broader it's it's the broader digital capabilities it's the skills to use the internet it's the skills to build applications it's the skills to 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 take you know the content to a level where it is really relevant and you know that importance of of uh, the the skills agenda as a comprehensive approach is is uh, is very important um and then i forgot the last question sorry about that never uh, uh investments but i think uh um no worries i think other panelists can take it thank, thank you, you. Uh, uh, please. Yeah, thank you, thank you, and I think actually Butena on the investment piece, I think you 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 covered that well when you gave your your numbers in your previous um, statement, and of course Butena also referred to uh, the World Bank's work in in Africa, and we have our digital moonshot uh, that we did together in the context of the Broadband Commission that estimated it would take a hundred 
billion to connect Africa by, by 2030. Um, it just quickly picking up on, on the points that, that you noted and, and from the questions, I mean, I, I certainly understand Edward's, um, Edward's point and I agree with, with Mario that it, it's not sort of one solution for everybody. Uh, clearly LDCs are at different stages of development as, as, the, as Edward had, had noted and face different challenges, different needs. Butena also spoke about the different geographical challenges that can also be, uh, be faced. Um, and so I think that, that underscores the importance of working with all stakeholders, working with local communities so that we can construct and adapt the right solution that's eventually gonna be sustainable. Uh, for us, we see that this whole of government approach is really critical, uh, that it can't just be the ICT ministry working in isolation with, uh, with other ministries. And that comes to the point about what's different. What's different now, and we can almost say thank you, COVID, uh, is that COVID has put connectivity across every single sector of the economy. And so we can't look at this siloed anymore. We have to look at this holistically. So no matter what stage of development you're in, you do need to take this holistic approach. Uh, it's the only way that you can get economies of scale. You do need that enabling framework. Uh, and all of the speakers have stressed the importance of that skills piece, uh, the human capital, the digital literacy, the digital fluency. Uh, and I think that's absolutely critical. Um, on the UN Foundation question that, that I saw, um, I think, it is important that donors and, and, and other funding agencies, that we try to bring them all together because there's too much fragmentation. I think that was the intent with the UN Secretary General's digital cooperation roadmap uh, in trying to bring players together around different themes. Uh, of course, the revamp of the UN development system and having the resident coordinators now responsible for bringing everybody together, that can also be one way that we can bring the other players together. But I also wanted to note, uh, because the UN Foundation posted that point, we did a lot of work with Dial on the SDG um, investment framework piece and, and this notion of, of digital building blocks. And so that you could take these digital building blocks and then you, then you can reuse them and adapt them as local communities and other constituents would, would need. Uh, and I'm happy to share that 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 link in in the chat if anybody's interested to look at that work that we did together. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. Please, Ken, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Um, please allow me just to comment uh, first on what um, Edward had, uh, you know, alluded to. Uh, indeed, uh, in line with ensuring that we don't leave anyone behind, which is really a hallmark of SDGs. Uh, we have got something to do with countries that are at war or countries that are transiting from war. And in the ILO, what we have is we have a whole issue of fragility frameworks. And so we do have specific programs that target countries that are in fragile situations. For example, we have the Jobs for Peace and the Resilience Program, which targets these countries to help them move uh, from where they are to as close as possible to a situation that they can also be able to benefit uh, from issues of digitalization, from issues of development, from issues of transformation. So we do that. Uh, and I think that is really important. So fragility is there, but we have got to sort it out. We have got to try and bring out the resilience that is important for us to be able to uh, avail them, to be able to be ready to benefit from transformation. Um, the other issue that uh, I would like to comment uh, on uh, is about the coordination, the whole issue of coordination, uh, whether it has to do with donor funding or even at country level, I alluded to that in my presentation about coordination. Uh, and knows very well that uh, the UN uh, follows a very important approach at the country level through the UN country teams and through what we call the uh, you know, country uh, corporate cooperation assessments, uh, which then give us priorities of being able to work together, put everything in a basket, and know the priorities of a country so that each one can come in and contribute to that. And I think that should continue. Uh, for countries that have not yet done those, if they could do that, 
it will be very useful uh, for the uh, development uh, you know, process. Um, the, the question that uh, was uh, about the private sector, uh, I didn't quite get it, but I think the role of the private sector in technological transformation is very key. And we are simply saying that late governments do a very good job of facilitation, late the private sector come in, create jobs, use the industrialization tag, and make sure that people benefit. We do not want to leave anyone behind. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Ken, Nadia, please. Yes, thank you. So I'll start with the from the private sec uh, sector perspective of um, funding and how do we, you know, kind of engage the private sector even more so. And you know, just speaking from the Microsoft philanthropy as far as what we look for in projects and um, opportunities, but I think also would relate to many other um, private sector actors as well. So you know, I think that there is definitely a hope, you know, for many of our companies to have the profit and purpose, and I think that's really changed in the last couple of decades where companies are truly looking, you know, I, I know we talked previously about the triple bottom line in the past, but I do think there is a, a pull to really, you know, as companies help to solve some of the world's biggest problems. I know that is something that we really uh, value at Microsoft and think about so that we can really help every organization and person on the planet achieve more. Um, I think that there are a couple of hallmarks that we should uh, remember that I think make it more attractive for private sector actors to really participate and, and fund and get involved is number one is how do we co-design together that we're not brought in, you know, just at the end of the process to say, hey, can you write that check, but that it is a, a collective effort of thinking through the problems. So that it would be a hallmark. Second one is data driven approaches. So I think that you know, one of the very important things is how do we ground the ideas and interventions and solutions and policies in looking at actual data? Um, and, you know, I think that's relevant for everybody too, but I think we do have now access to so much data. So why, let's leverage the power of the digital transformation and, and kind of find those trends and see what's worked and move those forward. The third is this opportunity to really try to be catalytic. And I think I mentioned this, you know, I think private sector has some ability to be a little bit, uh, you know, fit, like that fail fast mentality, speed matters, like agility. Um, and so can we use our investment to be that spark and to be catalytic? And do we have at the end that pu public sector solution, the government that can catch that and scale it? That's something that is really important. And it's, we know private sector is something that we can't do. And so um, that is another thing that we definitely look for. And then the sustainability aspect. So, you know, again, I think corporations, because we are, you know, selling the good and the product and we can't always be there to continue to fund it. So is there a way that we can see that future for the intervention that can continue on? So I think those are a couple of just hallmarks, maybe, you know, take them for what they're worth. I also wanted to just mention the, the um, you know, LDCs being at different levels and this aspect of like, it's not an equal solution we should give, but an equitable, you know, intervention so that each country gets what they need. And I definitely agree with that. Um, and I also think that we need to think about this as, as a regional approach. Um, and not just a country by country. So how do we knit all of that together? And is there a breath offer that is like a minimum viable product? You know, I think that's what we tried to do with the skills initiative. It was definitely a minimum viable product. It's not gonna be right for everybody, but it's something that everyone can tap into um, that could be available for all of the LDCs, you know, kind of solutions. And then how do you go depth country by country? I think you need to do both of those things um, in order to really, um, you know, meet countries where they're at, but also to move the needle and move things forward. So yeah, thank you for the, those great questions. Thank you, fantastic, Nadia. Um, me, Farouk, um, if you want to address some of the aspects of the questions, and then we go into the last round. I have a question for the panelists uh, to end. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, actually, uh, I, would, I would give an answer maybe by two words to all the questions access to finance related to the post-crisis situation, uh, related to post-COVID situation. Also, maybe I would uh, 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 refer Mr. Pizzini that um, in the, indeed uh, skills and what I would say expertise that was the reply to, uh, Ms., uh, to Monsieur Amadou was mentioned. But basically, what we were doing, uh, ourselves doing uh, or promoting, let's say, uh, industrial transformation, production in Africa, 
Sometimes when it comes to funding, of course, you need some funding, you need some seed or seed or upscale funding. And uh, sometimes Africa, uh, we have to distinguish. We, the, we're talking about availability and access to, I think in terms of availability, the funding is there. But sometimes uh, the banks or the venture capitals, the commercial or public banks are needing something more than feasibility study. Sometimes they don't even feasibility study or the business plan. What new, uh, what brought up, uh, it was the market orientation. Uh, the, the word also uh, uh, mentioned by, uh, by, by Naria from, for, from Microsoft, a minimum viable product. I need to come up a, with product. Talking a little bit business language, None, no a company, no cluster, no industrial park, no economy, no sector would generate jobs. And this is the main object of sustainability, of inclusivity when we talk about SDGs. If the, these uh, uh, entities are not producing something which is commercialized, so we're there to help to identify to uh, uh, each country the unique uh, uh, advantage they have, they can build upon. Uh, they can use industrial design, they can use innovative tools, they, they can use digitalized, digitalization tools. And uh, through promoting such productive activities, I think it is a, a good opportunity also to restore uh, intercultural exchange where, for instance, wars, where there was also good experiences. And talking about the COVID time and the resilience, we also have some good experience how we managed to to help companies not to stop, to continue their businesses, to take the challenge as an opportunity and even to expand, to adapt to what it needs, at least in, in, in the PPE business or in textile sector. So I think expertise and skills, this is needed. And uh, thank you so much, Mario, for mentioning uh, les, 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 les centres d'appui au secteur industriel which you need to uh, basically very famous with and trying to promote in the continent in order on all the LDCs. And we're ready to join hands with our partners, with our private sector partners, with the government partners to extend this. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, Farouk. Um, we have one question for Mario uh, Pezzini in the, in, the, in the chat, and then we will initiate the last round. I have a couple of questions for the panelists. Um, so maybe this, because it's for Mario, I like to, to read it, it's in the chat, but uh, if tech and digitalization will only work in the context of relative protection of LDCs productive capacities from global markets and more emphasis on intra-regional trade. Yes, thank you. Very important question, because in reality, we have seen that uh, the openness of the economy as such is not, maybe it's a necessary, but it's not a sufficient condition and therefore policies needs to be in place. In this respect, I think that certain strategies may also include not the protection, but the help to firms to establish, to be created and to grow, at least to a point in which they can be exposed to external competition. And in fact, I would like to warn in my answer to a crucial point. It seems that here we are very much a Schumpeterian. We do think that there is something such as creative distraction. I would like to prevent uh, Adao to think that there is also a deus ex machina. In other terms, that the digitalization in itself will solve all the problem and the market then will adjust for what remains to be addressed is not enough. We need strong policy and strong strategy to accompany these mechanisms. And how to put them in place? Here I would like to go back to a very crucial point that Doreen, under my point of view, raised when she tried to answer your question on financing. Well, it's true, Doreen is right. We need coordination. We have major plan from China to support development in Africa through the one belt, one, one road, Turkey, United States, European Union, different actors, but they don't coordinate to each other. So we need to have a table, maybe called by the African Union, that would allow for a discussion. This was a point that appeared this morning in the in the discussion. However, I have a, a hint to introduce in this perspective, and it is, yes, but we have only table, or we have very often table with only donors around. Is it conceivable? 
the development assistance committee is a committee that not even include all the OECD countries. And when you try to involve other countries, they are the Gulf countries, which are pure donor. OECD was created in 61. Before having a developing country, we had to wait 94. When we passed through the process of, uh, for example, decolonization without taking note of the fact that countries were on the scene in United in uh, in uh, United Nations, it was different. It was started with 50 countries, and in 61 they were already 100. I am not saying that we need all countries around the table. It would be a little bit of California, or there are already table in United Nations. But we desperately need table between peers, we are, where we do not distinguish donors from recipient, where money is not the only discrimination. There is knowledge that developing country may have much bigger and better, and we see in the crisis of COVID, than certain developing countries. So that's what I think we need. We need this table where countries discuss among themselves what they can do. And obviously there are banks for development, but a bank is not a great place. I don't uh, to have this type of discussion. I don't know that many bank that call the clients to discuss all together what to do. They are crucial, they are indispensable, but probably we need another space which is confident and a space in which this dialogue between different actors can be done in a quiet way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is a very specific question to, to Tena in the, in the chat about uh, how, can, um, how can the World Bank or uh, in general, the banks help um, access in finance to the um, less developed countries. So actually they can close the gap. Thank you. So the access to the resources can be through uh, the governments, working with the governments through the bank or and also working with the private sector through the IFC. Uh, and you know the way the way we do it, uh, it's actually something that the governments need to prioritize in their uh, strategy. Prioritize that digital is important in their development strategy, and it starts by a discussion uh, about this ecosystem approach that I mentioned. Uh, what are the key uh, elements that the government needs to focus on? Uh, whether it's infrastructure or skills or digital financial ser service or digital ID or a combination of all. So uh, we have projects that uh, have a 360 degree approach to digital transformation. If the government wishes to go that route, uh, we have also some requests from countries saying, I want to take one, one particular sector and I want to go deep into that sector. So e, uh, e agriculture, e health is another example. Uh, and in, in this, we work very, very closely with IFC because this is definitely a sector where the public alone and the private alone uh, cannot, cannot, uh, cannot do it. So it's a combination of thinking about uh, public approaches and private approaches that need to go hand in hand. And it is very important to make sure that there is full ownership of this by the countries and by the region. And, you know, the example of the Africa digital strategy is a very good example of how the region own this and put development partners, all of us, to the task. Uh, and, you know, it's very important because that what you know gives the the guidance to the donors to come to the table and offer the suite of possibilities that we can we can offer so just wanted to highlight uh, this approach thank you thank you very much uh, so we are now approaching the uh, end of the panel but obviously we cannot miss the opportunity to have such a fantastic diversity of views and uh, and and knowledge about the point that we are trying to discuss. So I'd like to ask uh, each of the panelists for a one, two minute final statement. And, um, and, and the question that I would like to raise is if there was one thing, um, and I know it's difficult because uh, systematically, I think all of you have been trying to find the connections of one thing and the other, but if there is one thing that LDCs and development partners should focus on, what would that thing be? And uh, second part of the question, 
is if there is one missing priority um, that you are seeing in the uh, program for action of health disease, uh, sorry, if there is one priority that cannot be missed in the next program uh, for action of the LDCs, what that priority will be. So one um, area to focus for development partners and countries, one priority that should absolutely be in the next 10 years program of action. And I'm going to suggest the same uh, participation as, as in the list of, of participants just to make sure that uh, I go in order. So maybe Mario Pazzini, if you can start. Yes, Maria, I have to confess to you that I am very much preoccupied for social issues and tension that we see appearing even before the crisis of COVID. And here, just not to make diplomatic mistakes uh, for, about Africa, let me quote Chile, where we saw that there was the contract, the social contract went broken. This would be the dimension that I think we need also to discuss that you are asking for. Uh, and therefore, the proposal that you are asking for, where if it is true that we are facing a crisis of the social contract, a potential or real, something similar to what we saw in Tunisia, in Tunisia after the Arab Spring, then um, I think that we need to figure out tools that will allow us to provide voice. Because what the people ask in the street is voice in developing country in Africa as well as in developed countries. And what is the tool? To define together a vision and the strategy with the voice of people. I think that we need place-based strategies or if you prefer, place-based plan that are built together with the population in order to identify a vision and also the strategy to get there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very powerful, giving voice to the people. Um, so we continue um, inviting. Now, Doreen, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so in terms of the, the first part of your question, the one focus area, I think my suggestion in terms of focus would be on, on youth. And I think you're already doing that. As, as you mentioned, you had a great youth session this morning. And with the uh, incredibly large youth population with 60%, if I understand, of the population under the age of 25, that I view as the greatest opportunity for the region. So I would say a, a focus on youth. In terms of the perhaps one priority area um, that would not have been included in the, the previous plan of action, uh, that's kind of a hard one because I think the previous plan did include um, infrastructure, expansion of, of, of electronic services. Um, maybe what it didn't include was this data-driven decision-making that, that Naria mentioned. I think that that whole importance of, of having the data and using that for decision-making perhaps is an element that, that should be added. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Doreen. Uh, Ken, please. Well, thanks, uh, Maria. Uh, for the first one, I think we need to focus on skills development. We have seen what COVID has done uh, in Africa, particularly, where most of the affected have been people or workers in the informal economy. And one reason is that they tend to have low skills and uh, they are not able to advance into formal you know, jobs because they may not really access those jobs because of their skills. We need to focus uh, on skills and particularly that we are looking here about you know, technology advancement. We just need those skills. In terms of priority, I think we should enhance the issue of fragility. Africa, most of our African, well, not most, a good number of African countries are in fragile situations. And that affects the ability to participate fully in development. We need to put that as a priority to build that important resilience. Thank you. Uh, great, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ken, for being so brief and, and, and I think uh, to the point. Uh, Naria, please. 
Okay, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to say, I'm going to say on the on the focus area that we need to have a unified kind of theory. Um, I think for me, it's, it's about the skills at the end. But in order to have that, it's you also need the connectivity uh, devices, and you also need the skills to use all that. So it's like, how can we do those three things together, maybe as a focus? <laughs> so sorry about the a little bit of cheating. And then number two on the priority. Um, I think I'm gonna to have to go agree with Mario. I mean, I think the thing that we can do differently this time, um, you know, emerging from all these crises, like I know that we've taken many approaches, but how can we center on the voice of the people that we're trying to serve um, and ask them for the solutions because they are living the truth and they, they know what they need and how can we truly listen and integrate that voice into the decisions and interventions and policies that we pursue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Butena. Thank you, um, and I'm also going to use the same approach of, as Naria. I think it's not one. I think it's not one one focus. It's not one one priority. Uh, I think uh, thinking about supply and demand at the same time, we need to make sure that there is a good infrastructure and it is affordable, but that infrastructure is meaningless if there is no content that fills those pipes. And those contents cannot happen if there are not the skills behind it. And it doesn't matter at the end of the day if those solutions do not address the local needs. So it is this ecosystem approach, uh, a narrative that you know brings the element together, uh, as I think is is a, is a top uh, a priority. Uh, and you know the the addition is basically taking advantage of the situation that we're in today. Uh, and I think you know Doreen mentioned it very nicely. Uh, COVID really took the agenda to the next level. We moved from asking why digital is important, which was the question, you know, last time <laughs> we were talking about digital, to the question about how do we do it in a way that is fast and get us the results that are needed. And I think for that, uh, you know, thinking differently about collaboration, it's collaboration between the public and the private, a new approach. It's a new partnership, I think, where each one brings something very important. It's a different way to col of collaborate among the uh, collaboration among the partners within countries. It's, uh, the collaboration between the ministries having this as a mandate with all the other ministries from the other sectors. So uh, a different approach to, to collaboration, I think, is is uh, uh, a good a good uh, addition to how we think about uh, the topic. Thank you. Wonderful, Farouk, please. Thank you so much. It was indeed a challenging one, but uh, let me maybe swap the order between focus and, and priority, or you might apply both to the focus and priority. I think uh, in two words, sustainable uh, competitiveness, not only based on what we traditionally say on comparative advantages of least developed countries, but we are introducing what we call intellectual value added or intangible value added. Let us also take advantage on traditions on human, women, and youth capital, which is unique in each LDC. And with, with that, I think the big transformation could be achieved. More jobs could be created, more uniqueness, uh, more uh, uh, special advantages for each LDC could be found. And I think the strategies uh, have to be more implementation oriented, or when thinking policies, we have to think about already action plans and try to be focused more on implementing those those policies. The policies, the good policies are there. Let's go for implementation. Thank you. Um, fantastic. Thank you very much. I think this is the end of our panel, but I and I cannot summarize everything that you have said, but I really want to underline some key points that I think are very important. Um, um, there is something very special about COVID, and I think the colleague um, who raised the question about the post-conflict uh, country situations. I have had, the, I think, the, the privilege of serving in many post-conflict or conflict countries. And actually something very important that you raised is true. It is about inclusivity and making sure that the voice of people is listened. A, a war context normally is about, you know, uh, creating noise space by for, uh, for those who have 
the force of guns. And here we are talking about the power of technology to open a space for expressing in a transformative and positive way, ways of thinking. And I think this is so powerful and, and it is new actually, the way in which young people can really bring about change in TikToks or in, 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 the, in, the, in the social uh, uh, networks, I think is quite interesting. So I think it touches upon governance very deeply. And I think there is also a very important point that you are making um, that um, it really resonates a lot in the way in which we work in developing at the country level. Uh, and it is really looking at uh, the people of the country, not just as clients, um, and that would be from the private sector uh, or as uh, beneficiaries. But I think we are being challenged right now to start thinking about those that we need to work so we want to achieve digital transformation as active participants. And that's where the point about young people that you are making, it's so critical. So if you look at Africa, honestly, how can you transform Africa if most of young people is part of the informal sector and yet have no opportunity. So absolutely, I think we are, um, I think it was mentioned. I think the issue of the fragility needs to be addressed as you pointed out very clearly on a whole of the country approach. I would even uh, take the point that some of you were making about a whole, a continental approach. I mean, it should go beyond, you know, if you look at Malawi integrated in the region of Zambia, Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, but also South Africa and beyond. So I think maybe that's something that LDCs in itself cannot develop, but it should be part of a broader community. And actually it connects very, very nicely to the whole point of skills and human capital that you are making. Um, we need the content, but we need the people having access to the content. So I think that point is essential. And I, I really like um, a point that you have all made about the need to, to really establish a collaborative approach, a new paradigm, a new social contract that brings private and public in a different light. And I think we are seeing people that is not taking uh, things for granted, that they want to express themselves and they're going to be demanding. And, uh, and I think that's a responsibility as development practitioners private sector governments we have, because we need to have also the environment that is enabling to do that in a peaceful manner. So actually, um, just as some of you mentioned, uh, being a resident coordinator, and that's uh, beyond my moderator role, so I hope uh, it can be permitted, gives us a unique vantage point to see all of those actors. I mean, like, we, we work with all of you, and we are trying to go further and, and establish uh, um, greater um, links with regional organization. OECD came to work in Malawi. Uh, we were invited uh, and did something very nice with us just to see how we exactly do this transformation. And I think we have no time to lose. And um, Malawi is now working on, on a in, um, in a recovery plan, uh, COVID recovery plan that I think everything that you have been talking about today should absolutely be part of that um, proposition so we can all engage together. So it's about partnerships in the end. Thank you very much. It has been a fantastic um, session. I have learned a lot with all of you, um, really the experience, the amount of information, data, and also ideas has been very, very illuminating. I'm going very happy home tonight and really thank you for this opportunity to be with you today. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Hasta luego. Gracias. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. We have, uh, please remind that the conference, the Africa Review meeting continues. Uh, tomorrow there is another full day. Uh, very exciting. Please, uh, for, for attendees, uh, for that is really very open. I know we were having hundreds and, 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 and more people connected to the panel this afternoon. Uh, please continue uh, following the discussions. It's extremely interesting. And uh, to the government of Malawi, really thank you very much for their hosting and uh, for all the efforts uh, to make this conference so meaningful. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.